we're back. It's the first day of March. The snow is almost gone. There's a glimmer of hope for those of us still in COVID lockdown. Honestly, I am dreaming of jumping in the van and heading off on tour to visit some of the places, the locations, the, the tombs, the graveyards, the places I've been talking about in my TikToks and on my YouTube. For now, though, we're still stuck at home in the north of Scotland. There's some homeworking, there's some homeschooling. One daughter is covering the Black Death in history, which is great. Uh, the other claims to be studying Hamilton in drama. I'm Susie Edge, medical doctor and historian, and I've become fascinated by how we've treated the human body in life and in death. But let's face it, mostly in death. I have been so thrilled to see so many subscriptions, follows, wonderfully encouraging comments after my first uh, trailer podcast. And I really, really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, let's do this. Let's see what we can create. So grab a coffee or something stronger, because we're going to take a deep dive into the stinky death of William the Conqueror. The Duke William of Normandy was the bastard who was victorious at the Battle of Hastings in the year 1066. And we're not angry with him for invading England. We're not calling him names. He really was called William the Bastard. He was the illegitimate son of Robert the Magnificent and Helaver of Felines. What great names. But we're going to call him Duke William of Normandy because that's better for the children. Now, he was absolutely definitely not the one who made the schoolboy error of looking up into the sky over Hastings when a soldier shouted, look out. And so he missed out on an arrow splitting his retina in half on its way through his eye and into his brain. That was his enemy, Harold Godwinson. And to be fair, that probably didn't happen. But we're going to come to that. Harold gets his own podcast at some point. William survived the fight, unlike Harold Godwinson. And so he was able to claim the throne of England. Now known to us as William the Conqueror, he's the first of the kings of England on our list in that infamous year of 1066. William believed the throne of England was his, promised to him by his distant cousin Edward the Confessor. It was an arrangement that the new King Harold had sworn to uphold. William was peeved, so he went to take it for himself, and he did. Now, William's post-coronation shenanigans included building new castles, settling his Norman nobles in England, the harrying of the North, changing of the clergy, and of course ordering the compilation of the Doomsday Book which was a record of all the people in their land, or rather his new land. Now, he didn't hang around in England too long, though. He went back to France. I mean, let's face it, the weather is slightly preferable. 21 years after the Battle of Hastings, William of Normandy was still out there fighting and pillaging. William rode his horse through the streets of Mont after a raid. He might well have been brooding over the French king, saying he looked like a fat pregnant woman because he'd got quite big. Around him the city burned as his pillaging troops set alight to the houses. A burning building sent up a lively hot spark, and William's horse was spooked. Now Dobbin reared up and came down with a crash. William's giant frame, which had grown much too big in recent years, with a few too many burgers and beers in celebration of conquering, he was thrown forward, hitting his ample belly against the heavy iron pommel of his saddle. The force on his abdomen, which pushed his insides back against the hard bones of his spine and pelvis, was enough to squeeze and perforate his bowel or bladder. It could have been either, or even his urethra. But there is an argument against the perforation being of his bowel. In such an injury as this, one would expect to hear of a painful distension of his abdomen, accompanied by vomiting, which was not mentioned in reports of the king's death. There was mention of his giving in to moaning about the pain, which isn't that surprising. A perforation of his bowel would have meant that the bowel's contents, all those burgers and beers, which are usually separated from the, from the lining of the abdominal wall, the peritoneum, by the walls of the bowel, well, they spill out, and the faeces and the bacteria would be free to cause trouble. The result is a peritonitis, infection and inflammation of the peritoneum, which untreated can lead to a painful death. Now, such a case as this would require a surgeon, an anaesthetist, lots of theatre and ICU nurses, and a holy grail full of antibiotics. Now, Orderick made no mention of an ICU admission, but we must remember that his account was written 60 years after William's death, so he might have missed out a detail or two. 
Alternatively, the forceful crash of William's lower abdomen against the saddle's pommel could have perforated his bladder or even his urethra. That's the tube that brings urine from the bladder down to the outside world. An injury like that, though rare, could happen with a forceful push of a saddle between the legs. A perforation of the bladder would have led to haematuria, or blood in the urine, which again one would expect to have seen commented on. It's a big thing to see blood coming out in the urine. Leakage of the urine out of tubes inside the body can lead to infected collections and as a result in potentially deadly sepsis. Backup of urine to the kidneys can affect their function and if the kidneys don't filter blood, you're facing trouble. Whatever he perforated, it led to his death and it took a few weeks. William had asked to be taken to Rouen, the duchy's capital, to the priory of Saint-Gervais, where the monks could treat him. The chronicler Audric wrote that in that time he was repentant, sorry for all the brutality, especially in England. He also had time to make plans for his sons and his lands, making William Rufus King of England and Robert Duke of Normandy. William died of complications of an internal rupture, shall we say, on the 9th of September in 1087. He was lucid in the morning and then he died. The story of what happened to William the Conqueror did not end there. Of course it didn't, you know me well. As soon as the king was dead, there was a bit of panic on the streets of Rouen. The nobles around him left to protect their own lands and belongings, leaving the servants behind, who pilfered all of the king's belongings. They looted the contents of the room and even his finery and clothes, leaving his body unceremoniously dumped on the floor of his bedchamber. And the king's cold, dead body started to discolour. His body was recovered, but there was little dignity in what was to come. His courtiers took so long to decide how to honour him, how and where to bury him, who to invite to the after party, it took forever. And the Archbishop at Rouen declared that the body of the king should be taken to the monastery of Saint Stephen in Caen, but then there was no one around to deal with it, embalm it or remove his intestines. On the way to Caen, the procession had to stop as there was a fire to contend with. His burial just had to wait some more. But decay does not wait for us mortals, even the divinely appointed monarchs. At Caen, there was more waiting. A knight called Aslin of Caen came forward to claim that the church had been built on land belonging to his father, that that land had been stolen by William of Normandy and he had no right to be buried there. He wouldn't let the burial take place until they paid him off and he decided, sure, it was fine, they could, they could now go ahead. So eventually they could bury William. But whilst all this waiting was going on, his rotting corpse was getting bigger and bigger. The body swell after death because the mechanisms in place to keep the bowel contents inside the bowel fail, and so all the contents can leak out. It might have already happened with the peritonitis, it might already have got going. But the bacteria, they can now go to lunch, burping and farting as they munch away on yummy king stew. The gases swell the body, and if you try, as they did, to shove that swollen, gas-filled corpse into a stone coffin, something's going to give way and explode, and it won't be the coffin. It's hard to imagine quite how bad the exploded king corpse must have smelt. The sensor burners swing from side to side on their chains ahead of the procession, spreading the smoke and frankincense and spices, but they had no effect. The putrefaction in the air hit the nostrils hard. They had to finish the ceremony and get out of there fast. William Rufus, one of William's sons, the one who became the next King of England, he commissioned a tomb for his late father. And William the Conqueror did surprisingly well to rest in peace for 500 years, until the Pope let someone open up his tomb and take a look in 1522. Now, all was found to be well. He was reinterred, but 40 years later, a Calvinist mob broke in. They were expecting to find riches, and when they found nothing of interest, they sacked the grave. What was left was again gathered and reinterred, but later was destroyed in the same way during the French Revolution. One single thigh bone, a left femur, was rescued and reinterred. In the 1960s, that single femur was found again. The thigh bone, the largest bone in the body, can tell you quite a lot, even a single one. They can give clues about the height and health of its owner. This one came from a man measuring between 5 foot 9 and 11. It was thought to be all that remained of William I. And so it was buried again in 1987, 
to mark 900 years since William the Conqueror's death. On his tomb, a Latin inscription in marble slab states, Here lies the invincible William the Conqueror, Duke of Normandy and King of England, founder of the house, who died in the year 1087. And can we define invincible? Well, I suppose the thigh bone is, so far. That's it. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Hope it wasn't too smelly for you. For more of this, you can come and hang out on TikTok. I've changed my username to at Susie Edge, S-U-Z-I-E, E-D-G-E. Uh, on Instagram, at Suze.Edge. I'm on YouTube as well. Please subscribe, leave reviews, all that good stuff. It all really helps. Uh, you can help run the show by going to buymeacoffee.com slash edgeandco. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to those who've bought me a coffee. I really appreciate it so much. And thank you from the bottom of my now famous buy a tapestry mug. <laughs> Thanks again. See you next time.